Hey, it's Michaela Gordon, and this is the first episode of So Funny It Hurts, where we interview your favorite funny people and explore the trauma that made them that way. Now, I am so gagged that this is my first guest ever, Broadway dubbed you the original celebrity social media influencer, garnishing 8 million views at one time on your website. Please welcome Mario Armando <laughs> Lavandiera Jr., otherwise known as Perez Hilton, baby. Applause for myself. <laughs> Kitty bitty bumba, bitch. Well, uh, I'm assuming that a lot of people who are watching or listening know who you are, but I feel like I need to give you an introduction. Give me All right. The intro. I am thrilled to be on the inaugural podcast from not just talented singer, but also television and radio personality, Come Michaela on. Gordon. Hi. For the last many years, you you had a radio show. Yeah, I that did. Was, it was a national, right? Yeah, I hosted a national LGBTQ morning show. So you show. are a pro at what you do. And we you do, do many different things very well. Well, in this industry, you have to, as you know. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to have going. longevity. Yeah. You know, that's one of my guiding lights, like Joan Rivers. The best. She did so many different things, not necessarily because she wanted to, but because she had to. If you want to have a long career, unless you're in that 1%, uh, you know, the, the, the A plus list, yeah. you have to diversify. You have to be able to be malleable and say yes. So um, I'm so excited to, to be here well, and chatting with you. I'm so happy saying yes. You did say yes to this podcast. And we've both recently just moved to Vegas. Although you're from here. I am from here, but I'm loving it. How what do you feel you about back? living? Um, honestly, quality of life. L.A. How long were you in L.A. for? I was in L.A. for 15 years. Okay, wow. And I loved it. Um, but when my LGBTQ morning show ended, our family's here. I have a lot of life here. And Vegas is very different now. I can do all the things I enjoy doing. I can sing. I can do a podcast, which I love. Um, I recently reconnected with my father, which I talk about a lot. We went to therapy He's a musician. last year. I saw that. Yeah. Uh, we had many years where we didn't speak. Um, and so we went to therapy last last year so i'm, I'm going to interview you it's, your, it's my podcast Ex now <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think it's really telling you know the concept of your show why don't you explain it to people well i think it's you know really crazy because uh, i wanted to have you on and i wanted to do the the podcast because when i started dissecting comedy i found that a lot of comedians and funny people do suffer from trauma i mean look at robin williams the question is why are the funniest most interesting people taking their own lives. And when I sort of dissected, somebody one time said, uh, God, you're really funny, Michaela. And I said, thanks, it's the trauma. And then I said, that's a really sad thing to say, but it's really very true. And, you know, in 2020, I was forced to go into therapy. I lost my grandmother, which was very difficult for me. And sometimes it's those life altering moments. I got into therapy in 2020 as well. Did you? Was At something the happened or it was just like. It was being the father of three young children that were being homeschooled yeah. and the pandemic and having carried over baggage from the year before that when my mom had cancer and her boyfriend died from cancer. It was wow. wild. And I never processed all of that. And I'm jumping ahead, but you know, my dad died when I was, it was the summer between sophomore and junior year of high school. And I never, when as a teenager or even a young person processed it. So getting into therapy helped me deal with that and helped me just see things more clearly. And actually, if it were not for my therapist, Dr. Brad, I love you. Dr. Brad, we love you. I don't think I would be in Vegas because, you know, the brain is so powerful. I, know. I had convinced myself that I needed to stay in Los Angeles Same. because I was there for so long. I was there for 20 years and I'm Perez Hilton. I need to be in LA. Yeah. But I... I first wanted to move to Vegas in 2018 when I was here for two months doing Chippendales as a celebrity yes. host. I didn't take my clothes off. But we wish was, you did, no, baby. That body's I, looking good, honey. I was just the MC. <laughs> and getting to experience Vegas as a local, it totally changed my perception of it. And also, I've been coming to Vegas since 2005, so I've already built friendships here. Yeah. And it was just calling me and calling me. And I almost bought a house here, but I didn't because I'm Thank a very- Thank God the market crashed soon after 2005. Well, I'm a very practical person. And 
many years ago, it was illegal to have a house and rent it out as an Airbnb, even though everybody I did know, it. I know. Everybody did it, but I am a big target. If I would have done what everybody else does, I would have get ratted out. Yeah. And I didn't want that. So thanks to Dr. Brad and the pandemic, I'm finally here. It was a big adjustment at first because I've got three young children. If I would have been moved, if I would have moved as a single person, it would have been a lot easier. Uh, but... Back well, to you for a second. Well, I wait. I okay. want to talk about something because I think that this is really important because you've made your career. When you started in 2000, what was Four. it? Four. Yeah. You started, you were really the number one gossip column. Yeah, there, Good, was, bad, there wasn't even hated, TMZ. Nothing. There nothing. was nothing. It was me. <laughs> but before even that, I know that you grew up in Miami with your mother uh -huh. and father. You went to an all boys Catholic school. Yes. Um, at what point did you know if this is okay to talk about, that you were gay. I always knew. Did that affect you in any way when you Absolutely. went to the all boys school? Oh yeah. Did you suffer from being bullied? What was kind of your childhood? Because a lot of people are quick to say, and this is the part of the podcast that we get into, you're you're trying to be funny. You're trying to be mean. Da, 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 da. You've been hated or not or whatever. But I do believe that it always stems from somewhere. And when you get to the heart of it, it's a very interesting story to tell. However... I, well, first of all, I'm, I, even though there are people out there, I don't care what people out there say. Yeah. I can't. If I did, I would, I would probably retired by now. <laughs> um, but I know that I do things very differently than I used to. Yeah. For sure. And I take full ownership of what I did. I, I'm not excusing anything away. This is just to give context and yeah. explanation. Yeah. Um, you know, growing up in Miami in the 80s and 90s, because I'm old, uh, it, it was really difficult being a closeted fat gay kid. So those were two things that made me a big outsider. You know, like even people don't even talk about that enough. Like you look at the news, we don't ever see an obese or an overweight newscaster. And... The majority of Americans are overweight. We don't see those people on TV. So it was hard growing up fat. I was probably bullied more for being fat because that was more an acceptable form of bullying right. than for being obviously gay. So they but, knew. But I wasn't out because I went to this all-boy Jesuit school. And I remember they would brainwash you and condition you. I was in theology class because you were forced to take religion. And I don't want to name her, but she's a lovely, she's fine. She's a, she's a really nice woman. Name her. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, she's a lovely woman. Um, she said, you know, there are studies that claim that 10% of the population is gay. And I'm like, oh my God, wow, is she really saying that? Wow, they're, she's like acknowledging you that gay seen. people exist. And then she goes but you boys are not like other boys. So she's like- So she took it back. Exactly. Like right away. Um, so yeah, it, it was definitely hard because I never, even though, and, and I also grew up really like middle to lower middle class. Like I went to an all boys school, but because we did that, my family didn't have like a nice car. We didn't go on fancy vacations. The money that they would have had to do those things, they, they saved to, send my sister and I to private school. Right. Um, so it, it. Listen, it, I went to Catholic school and I was raised very poor. It's a very difficult thing to going to a private school, knowing that you're gay and being poor. So let me just commend you on that because okay. I, I do understand that. It, it was hard because I don't know. I just never felt I belonged ever. That's why I, as soon as I turned 18, I was like, I'm going to New York city. Yeah. It was the opposite of Miami. I was not drawn to Los Angeles. And that's one of the reasons why, like, I miss nothing of LA. Yeah. Like, I don't even go, like, oh, did you miss the ocean? Fuck no. <laughs> I grew up in Miami. That's a good ocean. Yeah, yeah. The Pacific is cold. In the ocean. It's freezing. Even in the summer, it's super <laughs> cold. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I just knew there was more to life than Miami because back then, and honestly, I, I think it's still like this. Like, it's very homophobic, very racist mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. and so like the latin the cubans and probably all the other latinos they're so racist in so many ways right like racist against white people 
even though there are, there are a lot of white Cubans and white Latinos, like I'm a white Cuban, but they're like, they don't like white people. They don't like gringos. They don't like black people. They don't like anybody that's different. And it's like, I, 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 I never felt that because I knew I was different. So when did Mario turn into Perez Hilton That's and did that question. sort of become the layer that said, well, you can break Mario, but you can't break Perez. Was that the defense that you took on and went to New York with? I think Perez was birthed after my dad died because, you know, he died suddenly. He oh, you didn't, he wasn't sick. You didn't no, know. he had an aneurysm. And I wasn't home, so I never got a chance to say goodbye. And he died seven days after my grandfather died, who lived with us, which it was my mother's father and her husband. They both died a week apart. And, you know, my mom, now that I'm an adult and a parent myself, I have so much empathy and understanding for her. She was just trying to hold it all together yeah. and not die herself. Because people do die of a broken heart or will take their own lives or whatever it is. Or, you know, she lost half her weight in her body weight and, and developed diabetes. Like she was not diabetic. Then after my dad died, right. all of a sudden my mom has diabetes. Well, grief is such a difficult thing to navigate. Yeah. Do you feel like you went into protector mode for your mother when oh, she I, lost the two men in her life? Yes, I remember I... I felt at like 14 or 15, I need to call people and I need to be the one to let them know what happened. But you, you know, were 14. Yeah, I was really That's a young. lot of responsibility. And, you know, my mom was just trying to hold it together. So she was doing the best she could. I would like to think if something like that were to happen now to like if my mother were to die suddenly, you know, I'm going to put my kids in therapy. I'm going to like make I'm going to talk about it. Like we never talked about it. I was never in therapy. You know, therapy is a very well, for Anglo Italians, concept. Cubans, yeah. Jewish people. It's that really, especially in the 80s and 90s, yes. was a very taboo yeah. subject. And I never did that. So I never, I never dealt with it. What I did was I drowned myself. I escaped in the television and in music and in pop culture. And it, it, it was like a crutch though. It stunted my development in many ways. And it also helped form the basis of who I would later become. But in, 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 in many ways, like I, I wasn't even present in my adolescent life. Like I didn't have many friends. I didn't have hobbies. I didn't go outside and play and do things. I would just watch TV all of high school. Yeah. And, and, and that was it. How was your high school life? Was it, were you bullied? Were you sort of just non-existent? No, I was bullied, but I didn't cry about it. Like I, I, I was able to find like-minded freaks in the, the drama club. So it wasn't a lonely experience. And I just knew this is temporary. Yeah. I knew it wasn't going to be forever. And I made the best of it. Yeah. And I'm thankful, you know, like I was a, I was a good kid. I, yeah. I, I behaved, I, I did well, well in school. I got a full scholarship to NYU because of that. Huge. Thank God. I mean, I think it's important to just know this context though, because so many times we watch people, especially people that got famous in 2002, 2004, 2006, 2007, there was never any context towards everything and anything. We were just doing a lot of whatever we wanted to do. So fast forward, you moved to New York, mm -hmm. you kind of blew up. Well, I, I, I started in L.A. blogging in 2004. Uh-huh. And, um, yeah, w you know. What was the, I want to know the defining moment when you go, Perez Hilton just made it. I was temping at E. <laughs> uh, you know, it's so funny. Um, I, God, I have, God, so many stories. <laughs> um, all right. I started blogging in September of 2004, and at the time I was working, and I think, you know, there's no embarrassment or shame. It's, it's, it's life is wild, and, and sometimes failures and defeats are necessary. And they, so necessary. And, and it's 
it's God's protection and it's God's plan. And I, I'm not like a religious person, but you know, God, I use the term God as in like life or the universe But listen, I think it's really important that people normalize, normalize failures because I have fucked up so many times, embarrassed, sh ashamed, mortified. I, hello. And now at 35, I'm like, I really don't, I needed all of that to just stand on my own two feet today. So it's important to, to talk about it. So in, in uh, the fall of 2004, when I started blogging, I was working at a gay men's magazine. I think they're still around. And now we're all cool. It's all good. Um, it, the magazine was called Instinct. Uh -huh. And I was the senior editor. Big title, very little pay. I remember it. I, I was getting paid $35,000 a year. And I had taken a pay cut to, to go to that job because it seemed more fun than my old job. My job prior to that was working at GLAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. Yeah. I was their publications manager, but it was just so stuffy and corporate and not fun. And I wanted fun. And I, you know, at the magazine, I could get to, got to interview celebrities and I got to be creative. Um, and that's where I had ended up after a, a few years of Los Angeles and not making it as an actor. LA is the land of crushed dreams. Like so many people go to be <laughs> actors and most don't end up. A lot of them end up in casting or this or that or the other. Um, but I ended up getting fired from that gay magazine because I've always been a bit of a, a person to think outside the box. So I don't know if you remember, but in 2004, you know, I had friends that worked for a lot of the film studios and they would gift all their other friends like DVDs from their companies and they would go to Amoeba Records and sell it for money because everybody that was poor, like you're the assistant level, yeah. like you needed other ways to like supplement your income. So I'm like, how can I make more money? I was responsible for the books section of the magazine and we would get all these books to review and I would assign them out and then we'd have leftover books. So I was like, I'm gonna sell these books for cash. But Amoeba wasn't paying for books. They were just taking like CDs or DVDs. So I'm like, where can I sell these books? I sold them online on Amazon and I was so stupid. I used my real name. <laughs> and then I didn't create an alias for it. <laughs> then Out Magazine, the rivals, somehow found out what I was doing. And they went around and reached out to all of the publishers and advertisers that did business with Instinct, the gay magazine that I was a senior editor of. And the publisher of Instinct said, if we would have found out about this internally, we could have dealt with it internally, but it's being used against us. So we need to let you go. Yeah. And I had just taken a pay cut a few months before to go go to that job. I didn't have any money saved. So then I had to start temping. So I got a job temping at E and I was the front desk receptionist. So anytime. Which is so crazy to me. <laughs> uh, and actually that was the second time I had tempted it temped at E. When I first moved to LA in 2002, I'd also temped there for a while uh, working in their video vault. So 20, 2004, I was working as the receptionist. One day, I remember it was right before Thanksgiving, Janice Dickinson comes in. And in 2004, Top Model was a she big was a show. She was a big deal. She was a big deal in 2004. And I had the wildest interaction with her. She comes in. She's like, do you like my shoes? I'm like, oh, yeah, they're fabulous. She goes, do you know how many men had a fuck to get these shoes? I'm like... Uh, I don't know, but they're worth it. <laughs> then she goes, um, which way to the bathroom? I'm like, oh, down the hall to your left. She starts going to the bathroom and she had left her purse with her gay boy assistant in the reception area. Halfway to the bathroom, she goes like screams, shit, I forgot my tampon. Goes back to her purse, gets her tampon, goes to the bathroom. Uh -huh. Then this is the best part. When Janice Dickinson is in the bathroom, her gay boy assistant opens up her purse gets this prescription pill bottle, snatches some pills and puts it in his pocket. And I saw all of this happen. And I had started blogging at that point. And I started just out of curiosity. I'm like, oh, this seems like a fun hobby. Let me just, or fun, I'm curious. Like, let me try it. Uh huh. So then I thought to myself, should I talk about this or not? And I didn't think anybody was reading my blog. You know, right. I, I started in September 2004. This was right around Thanksgiving 2004. Yeah. I didn't think anybody was reading it. Right. Because who the fuck knew about it? Right. I remember, at the, I, this is so long ago. All I did was there was this website that predated Facebook, that predated MySpace called Friendster. Do you yeah, remember Friendster? Yeah, I do. I was on Friendster and I had my friends there and I put up a bulletin saying, hey, I started a blog, you guys, check it out. So 
the next day after I went home and I decided, oh, I'm gonna publish this because it happened right in front of my eyes in public. Yeah. It wasn't like, I'm not revealing any insider information. Like she went to go pitch that show or that conversation happened. I'm just talking about what happened in, in the public space. This hot blonde dude from HR at, at E comes and gets me, shows me a printout of my blog and says, you're fired. <gasps> So I'm like, wow, at least somebody's now, reading did that it. Did the blog blow up? Like it really it didn't blew take up. off? It did not right take then. that long. Like, so I started in September. It w when it really took off, that st it started in September 2004. And then by February of 2005, not even six months, this now defunct TV show called The Insider that was the companion show to Entertainment Tonight mm -hmm hit me up and they, and it's just crazy because so many, like the show doesn't exist anymore. The person that interviewed me, I don't even think is working in entertainment anymore. And she used to be iconic. Ananda I mean, this Lewis. is almost 20 years ago. Ananda Remember Ananda Lewis? Lewis. Yeah, uh -huh. she interviewed me. She came to my little apartment on Willoughby between Harper and La Jolla. <laughs> I lived above a garage, literally living it's above a, a garage. Area. It is a great area. Uh, and they did a segment on Hollywood's most hated websites. And they said, you know, how would you feel if we named you number one, the most hated website in Hollywood? And I said, well, I don't know. I think people like it. Like if they're in, if they're people are reading it, they're enjoying it. But sure, I'd rather be number one than number two. Yeah. So for the longest time, I called my I called it. It was PerezHilton.com, Hollywood's most hated website. Oh, like I honey, ran I with it. I know it was. I know it was. I ran with it. Um, and yeah, it happened really quickly. I mean, but, I think it was a different time. You were. I had no competition. Fighting, I, you, there was no digital media. There was nothing. Okay, I want to talk to you about something I read that was your biggest regret. I will tell you a story because it's going to go into the, my next question. Okay. When I was hosting my national morning show. I was I, on there, right? Yeah, you were on our show, of course. I had a fish named uh, Ruth Beta Ginsburg. It was a beta fish. Okay. And I loved this fish. I was very attached to this fish. Um, and I woke up one morning at 5 a.m., and I was really feeding it, running out, whatever. I get a text. I get to work. I'm watching the news. I'm doing what I need to do. And I get a text and I say, oh, my God, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is dead. And my co-host is screech halts. My producer's like, oh, my God, we got to get all over it. And I'm like, I can't believe this. I start to cry. I'm like, oh, my God, this is so sad. I'm so upset. My co-host is really upset. My boss comes running in. And I'm like, wow, everyone's really interested in, in this. This is a big deal. And my boss, who you know, said, Michaela, where did you see this? And I said, well, I got a text from Lisa. And they're like, well, can you confirm like who said this? And I was like, well, Lisa, Lisa told me. <laughs> and they're like, but where, where did Ruth Bader Ginsburg die? And I go, in my kitchen. And they're like, what do you mean Ruth Bader Ginsburg died in your kitchen? And I go, well, she was just a fish. That's where oh, she lived. Oh, no. I, a national, on my national show, announced that Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, but it was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> the morning show lost its marbles. They were so upset. I was so embarrassed. Were you, but you were, you, there, it was just like an, a, an honest mix-up? Yeah, it was just an honest mix-up. And I thought everybody knew about my fish. <laughs> and I share everything. So I was like, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said. I got in so much well, trouble. a long time ago, I said my Fidel question Castro is, died. Yeah. Fidel Castro is where I'm going. I yeah, read yeah. that it was the biggest regret of all. Well, that's, I wouldn't say that's my biggest regret. One of them. But that's like one of my, I would say that's my biggest F up. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so what, what happened? My biggest regret is just how I used to do things, you know, the tone, the, the, the unnecessary attacks against people that I deluded myself into saying it's okay to say those things. Like, but I'll get back to it. Yeah, no, um, I got information that was wrong. And <laughs> but, you put it out there. And I, but I was like, it was, they were impeccable sources. And listen, I think I was still right, actually. I don't know if we ever really saw him in public after that. <laughs> like, Just saying. You're still I'm going with it. You're like, I still I'm not some broke conspiracy the theorist, the gel, but. But we never saw that bitch again. Yeah. Um, okay. I. Uh, What's your biggest regret? Oof. You know, it's going to sound so cliche. I don't know. Uh, okay, so my biggest regret may be 
that I didn't finish out my season on American Idol. I don't know if this is a regret, but I lost my mother's girlfriend to a drug overdose the day before I left for Hollywood. And, and then she you had to take my, your mom with you. Your mom I, was in a mental institution. So my mom, uh, yeah, she was she's bipolar. She was getting medicated. It was a very difficult time for her as a mother as well. And I'll always commend her for taking me. But when I went on the show, I was reading the message boards. I was roomed up with Carrie Underwood. What, what season was this? Four. And that was like 2005. Five. Mm -hmm. A long time ago. Yeah. And I remember <clears throat> going to the producers and saying... Um, I just can't do this anymore. Like navigating my mother's mental health, navigating America, uh, navigating you were, you were so social. young though. I was, but it was even... How old were you? You were 16? I was 16. You don't have, you don't have empathy or compassion for that 16 year old child? I have child? so much empathy and compassion. I, I think my biggest regret is I wish somebody would have been there to say... It's okay. Like, you're okay. It's okay. I know as a 35-year-old what I had to do. Uh, I think it led me to where I needed to be. You were kind of mean to me on American Idol, though. Was I? I don't even remember. Called what did I say? You called me a loser. And you drew a <sighs> dick on my face. <laughs> like I said, so I... apologize. That's I'm why you're sorry. here. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've done very well for yourself. Thank you, babe. Listen, I, I get it. I, I It was such a different time in I media. Would, but here's the thing. This is why I understand why people aren't willing to let me evolve and see me for who I am today. Because what I did back then was not something that a 16-year-old did. I was a grown-ass guy in his late 20s who knew better and just didn't care. I knew what well, I was doing question, was wrong. Okay, but and I did my... it anyways because of the for the attention. All I cared about were the clicks and the views and the hits and the money that I was making. And it didn't bother me if I hurt somebody's feeling feelings. Um, okay, but my question to you is this, and this is really the premise of the whole show, because I know now now I know you. And I see that you're a father to two beautiful little three. girls and a little boy. Yeah. So and you have your mother with you yes. you've moved here. Hearing your story and why I think, because yeah, I mean, you dragged a lot of people. You outed a lot of mm -hmm. celebrities that you thought was okay. Which is one of the reasons why many or to most gay men hate me. Yeah. Plus, plus they hate me because I was, you know, feuding with their favorite divas or whatever. Yeah, it might Vanessa be. Hudgens, right? There was Every, Lady there was Gaga. Some, yeah, oh. you fought with all of them. My question though is, and then if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Was it coming from a place of never dealing with the death of your father and your grandfather and being that fat gay Cuban kid in Miami going to an all boys school and not really getting it was, noticed or accepted. Because listen, that's still a very primal need to be loved, wanted, seen. I'm not making excuses, but it has to come from somewhere. I think it was from insecurity. Like I found something that worked and then I pulverized i kept doing it and doing it bigger and worse like when i first started i was just like a you know i think it got worse and, and nastier and more toxic like things can you know grossness toxicity evil, an addiction it can it doesn't start off that way it gets progressively worse and i think talking about it like an addiction is a good way for to help people understand yeah. it like you know you might have um, your 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 mother's former partner. She died of an overdose. You know, she, when she was alive, she might have stolen from family and friends. She might have lied. Did that make her a bad, evil person? No, she was an addict that was struggling. Uh, you know, attention was my addiction. Yeah, because it. I was afraid. I was afraid. Like, wow, I. I I found my meal ticket. I found something that works. It's going to be, a, that's going to get me success. You know, I grew up poor ish. I mean, not, not poor. Like I we weren't, we weren't starving or anything like that, but very middle to lower middle class. I'm like, wow, this is getting me on TV. This is getting me talked about. Like I need to do more of this and more. And, and, and I kind of became like this Jekyll and Hyde character. Like I really, and also when, 
maybe you didn't experience this, but a lot of people, like when you achieve some success, it's real easy to drink the Kool-Aid and believe your shit doesn't stink. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, no, you still shit and your shit does stink and you're not special or different than anybody else. But, you know, I would, I, I, I bought into the Perez hype and I was like, oh, people don't like what I'm writing. They shouldn't read it. Or people don't like what I'm saying. They should just ignore me or whatever. And, and I actually, I, I purposely, poked people like I wanted a reaction a reaction yeah. was a win for me yeah it made me more relevant when a celebrity would take to Twitter to like insult me or whatever all right so what was the moment because I read in 2012 you were on stage with Deepak Chopra and Oprah oh my god wild which yeah. is such a difference than fighting with the Kardashians yes. while they call you their bully yeah what what was the moment that led you to that stage where you said okay here I am so I first began wanting to make a change in 2008, four years after I had started and, and, you know, achieved a lot of success pretty quickly. And what prompted that was I began my health journey, you know, in early Perez days, I was very overweight and just not healthy. Um, I didn't have any other issues, you know, I wasn't struggling with drugs or alcohol, but I don't like just saying fat. I like saying, I like, I like talking about it in terms of health. So I began my health journey and I became a healthier person and I lost a lot of weight. And then I found that the healthier I became, the happier I became. I even had, I was starting to have different thoughts, but I was afraid to make a change because I had been Perez by that point for four years. And I thought, well, if I rebrand, if I do things differently, well, will the money go away? Will people stop visiting my website? Will I stop? Well, I lose all opportunities. So I didn't do anything. I was paralyzed into inaction for a couple for a year and a half until uh, you know, in the fall of 2010, there was this rash of gay teenagers that died by suicide. I don't know if you remember it. So many of them, from Tyler Clementi mm -hmm. to, to others. And there was this journalist, Dan Savage, who created this campaign that really caught on called It Gets Better. Mm -hmm. It was a very simple concept. Older folks making videos for young people and sharing your stories and uplifting words. And I think I got a press release about it. And the first day that the It Gets Better campaign launched, I made a video. And I think I was the first personality to make an It Gets Better video. And I thought, in this time of darkness, I'm doing something to shine light and, and be positive. But the response that I got shook me to my core. Speaking of Kardashians, that is when Khloe Kardashian said, funny enough, he's the face of a non-bullying campaign when he's our biggest bully. And I, it, you know, I often watch the very last episode of the Oprah Winfrey show because it's required viewing. If you're depressed right now, not like it's Oprah's not doesn't have all the answers, but well, if, she kind of does. I mean, I'm an Oprah. I, I am. I belong to the book club. So I am an atheist. Okay. I love Oprah. <laughs> I, I like regularly go back and watch the the last episode of the Oprah Winfrey show where she's just talking to her audience by herself and basically sharing everything that she had learned in life up until that point. And one of the things that she said was. Just listen. The universe, God, your instinct, your gut, your intuition, whatever, it has the answers. And if you don't listen, God or the universe will speak louder and it'll keep speaking louder yeah. until eventually it'll smack you upside the head with a brick. And that was the brick to the head moment that it gets better video and the response that I got and people saying, how dare you? How dare you make an It Gets Better video? You're a hypocrite. You're a bully. You're part of the problem. And I knew in my heart that's not who I was, but the brick to the, the, brick to the head moment was it's who I had become. Right. So that is who I, that is who I was. And I'm like, okay, well, sh shoot. I need to make some changes because that's not who I am and that's not who I want to be. And... Then I changed. And listen, I still make mistakes. I'm human. But the big difference is I don't intentionally try to hurt people, which right. I used to in the past. Right. I knew what I was doing was bad. I wanted to hurt people because I wanted them to like lash out at me. I wanted attention. Sometimes I upset folks with my opinions, but I don't need to give people nasty nicknames or doodle inappropriate things on their photos or be outright cruel or nasty or vicious. I still have an opinion, 
like the ladies on The View have their, their opinions. Yeah. Um, and I share it in ways that I think now are not awful. So you're evolving now. You are a different person. You have three kids like we talked about. What does the situation look like if one of your children comes to you and says, I want to get into the industry. I want to be a singer, an actor, or I want to be a blogger. Would you support them in doing that, knowing how brutal the industry can be and how deep the criticism goes? Well, I would support my kids in anything they do after they graduate high school. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm like, well, it depends. Listen, um, if they got, I don't know, I'm, like, I'm, I'm raising my kids to be real normal, even though their dad doesn't have like a normal job. And even though their dad's like on the F plus list or maybe D minus list. Do you see yourself as that? I, I'm not an F lister. I'm, I'm, on the, I'm a solid D plus C minus. Well, it's okay. I'm a double D. So that's what <laughs> I'm on. Well, I'm on the D list. All right. Well, you know, I'm the double D There's together. the F list. There's the Z list. Uh, but uh, at <laughs> oh. least I'm on the D list. Okay. I'm happy with that. Or maybe C minus. Or uh, although in Vegas, I'm a solid B, I think. Ooh, hi. I'm a B in Vegas. Yes, you are. I'm so Vegas. happy to be here. And that's why Vegas is better, honey. It is. Listen, I'm like a three in LA here. I'm like, I'm all over. No. Um, if my kids got an offer to do something and it didn't interfere with their schooling, use that money, put it in their college funds, you know, like, great. But I'm not sending my kids out on auditions or anything like that, even right. if they're passionate about it. If you're passionate about something in the arts or blogging or whatever now, great, but it better not interfere with school. Priorities, got to keep them in check. And I, every day when I drive my kids to school, we go over our family mantra, like their eight talking points, the eight most important things what are in those? life. Number one is family. Number two is work very hard. Number three is listen. Fuck, I'm getting it. Like, I do it in Spanish. So let me, okay, so uh, do it in Spanish, right, right. Poppy. Number, number one is family. Number two is work very hard. Number three is listen. Number four is be healthy. Number five is, um, now I'm like, uh, 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 okay. Uh, tu familia, trabaja muy duro. Escuchar, ser saludable. No, no decir mentira. Don't lie. Grat uh, be grateful, uh, have fun, and breathe. And I feel like I those that. little eight mantras, those, those little eight words, phrases, talking points will help my kids throughout life. Um, but I tell them all the time, I never, I think I, I might have when I was younger, a, 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 a fresher, newer parent. I, I, I re you know, my kids love watching our old videos. So I, I got to bring back my vlogs. I, have, I haven't done vlogs in a while. Yeah. I do more like shorter form videos. because That's how things have evolved. I know. It really has changed so much. Yeah. It's not about vlogs anymore. It's about shorter form content. But my kids like watching our old vlogs. And I, I was watching one with them. And they, and I, I remember asking my son, well, what do you want to do when you're older? And I haven't asked that question in a long time. And I, and I don't want to ask that. Are you a little afraid of the answer? No, I'm not afraid of the answer. I just don't even want to put that pressure yeah. on them. They don't have to know. Right. You don't have to know. Uh, I, but what I do tell my kids is I will love you. And, and cause I like to be honest. I will love you. And oh, we know baby. Even we with know. my children, <laughs> I will love you and support you dot, 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 no matter what, unless you're lazy. I will not, I will not tolerate laziness. Like, you don't have to be as driven or ambitious. I'm cr I'm a crazy hard worker. You don't have to be as a crazy hard worker as me, but you know, like if you want to be a barista, fine. But I want you to be like be creating new drinks and go viral on social media because your drinks are so amazing. And then have the company want to open up a new store with you as the barista for the whole chain or whatever. I don't know, but like I, that's why like. My kids see how hard I work. And I think it's the immigrant mentality. Like, you know, my parents instilled that in me from as early as I can remember. You have to work harder than everybody else. Like, I'm not a real Hilton. My name is Mario Lavandeta. Yeah. I, I was, I, I, and, and listen, this year, the last six months, we've been talking about Nepo babies and nepotism. I would love for my kids to be Nepo babies, but I don't think that's going to happen. I personally would love to be a Nepo baby. I think okay? the opposite. I would love that. I think the opposite will happen. Like yeah. I think uh, my kids might, not even might, they probably will suffer 
doors closed and discrimination because of who I am. Do you really believe that? And it really is a genuine question. Do you think that people are still very much unwilling to let go yeah. of the shades of Perez Hilton yes. we met in the early 2000s? Yes. I know that if I were to die today, the majority of the world would celebrate. Wow. Does that hit, does that ride on you heavy a little bit? No. Cause like really it doesn't. No. Cause uh, you know, like I, all, then I put it into perspective and I'm like, Queen Elizabeth died and a lot of people celebrated her death too. It just, there's just a lot of stupid fucked up people out there, you know, and a lot of hypocrites too. Like, yeah, I said and did awful mean shit back in the day. And so many people were reading it and eating it up and co-signing it. And now, and now uh, doing the same thing in different ways. Like on social media, I see so many people making videos about Britney Spears concerned for her and this and that. And like, you're just using Britney for content and for views. And I know this cause I would do, I do the same thing. Okay. Like, yeah, it's like feigned fe outrage or feigned, you know, concern. Yeah. Well, or a it, hobby. It's like, it's weird. Not that you have anything to prove because you don't, especially not here. I just, I feel like I've often bis been misunderstood. I've often been, uh, called names that I didn't necessarily want to be called, but that's how I was perceived. So I just like to have this outlet of like, what does it really look like? And if somebody was listening right now, what do you want people to know about Mario, about you? Like if you were to die tomorrow, what would you all hope I they care did about? Know? I don't like on the like, tombstone. All I want is like, he was the best dad. Mm-hmm. And shared great music with the world. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I did help, you know, I helped a lot of artists back in the day uh, get a lot of attention. And, and um, I used to throw really fun parties. I remember I threw a party here in Vegas in 2008 at the now closed Privé at Planet Hollywood. Oh my God, I loved Privé. It was a 4th of July party. So it was 4th of July, 2008. And I got hired to host the party and I went and I said, Hey, can I have some performers? They're like, yeah, we don't have any money in the budget. No, no, that's, that's fine. I can probably get people to perform for free. There's this artist that I know named Lady Gaga. I would love to have her perform at my 4th of July party. And they're like, yeah, sure. Cool. And then she came and Donnie Wahlberg from new kids on the block. He's talked about this. Donnie was at my party, saw Lady Gaga there and said, I want that girl to open for new kids on our tour because she no performed way. at my 4th of July party. You know, like I've, uh, um, I, I, I want to be remembered as a, a, a pioneer, a trailblazer, an icon, all of the things I am. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I really, I call myself this because I think I am. I'm the original influencer, you know, before that word even existed. Yeah. I mean, I can't think of a single person who was that before me. That influential. I mean, influencer, content creator, right. like that, you know, like a social media personality because social media didn't exist. Yeah. I was the first social media in personality. You know, it was me. Then it was like, you know, now um, goes by Kara Cunningham. Back then it was Chris Crocker and uh, right. uh, Jeffree Star and Tila Tequila. Uh, all Love these people. Tila Tequila. She, I, was, I had the biggest crush on Tila Tequila. Bless her. She's, Bless her. She's. Um, mm -hmm. I know that's right. She's. Mm hmm. She's a hurt person. Listen, I will be the I first to say that I her. think reality television plays a huge part in people's mental health, especially back in the day. The shows like Rock of Love, all of those things were so contrived into your defense. And I do think it's important as somebody who found fame in the early 2000s, it was a different time. Things were very scripted. You could get away with a lot more. Everybody gets canceled now. Cancel culture is a huge thing for doing nothing. But I don't believe in cancellation. I don't believe in cancel culture either. I believe, well, Nick, I, this really resonated with me when I heard him say it. Nick Cannon, after he was canceled, he, he said, um, I believe in council culture, not cancel culture. Yeah, I love that. But people, you know, 
people and I shouldn't and I I know this because I used to you know I used to be outraged too with like celebrities that would didn't they were assholes or whatever. Um, a lot of people want to cancel folks just and and you know take their pitchforks out just as entertainment. It's like a hobby. They're bored, right. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, everybody likes to be righteous. Yeah. Okay, I want to play a game with you. Yes. Because I uh, adore you. Oh, I adore you. I remember seeing you perform here in Vegas at Rose Rabbit Live. I know. I used to love Listen, that we spot. We have a great relationship, but I would like to say for the record, even though you did draw a dick on my face <laughs> and call me a loser, I forgive you. <gasps> Why did I call you a loser? I, you tell me. I don't even remember. And I loved you. I You're have to tell you You're clearly not this. a loser. I have to tell you this. I'm sorry. It's okay. I was such a big fan of yours oh. and I couldn't wait for you to write about me. I was like, he's going to love me. What? I don't even remember. What did I say? Ugh. You called me a loser. I was, I was the like, loser. I'm a loser. I was the loser. You weren't the loser, but I am going to make you um, do a few more things. This game is called Apologize. Okay. Lies. Denies. Ooh. Are you ready? I'm ready. Did you or did you not also draw a dick doodle on one of my best friends, Kim Caldwell, in an article where she was singing American Idol, Kim Caldwell? Maybe, but I like her too. <laughs> Are we denying? I don't remember. Um, it's such a long time ago. Denies. I don't remember. I would say probably I did draw a dick on her. Okay, do we apologize? Yes, I'll apologize. Iconic. <laughs> Did I? I don't remember. You did. She oh. called me. I called her for the interview. She goes, you drew a dick on my oh, face no. too. And I'm like, well, for you, that makes sense. I'm a lesbian. Keep those dicks <laughs> away from me. Were you always a lesbian? Did you ever date guys? I did date guys. Um, but you I, knew you weren't into them. I, my first partner was a woman. I, not even, par- I was 14. Her name was Jessica. She played basketball. And I was like, that Jessica, baby, she's so <laughs> hot with that basketball. <laughs> and then I was like, no, I want to be famous. And then I went on American Idol. And then I didn't date at all. Um, and then when I started dating again, I tried to date in the lesbian world. They weren't having me. They thought I was straight. They were really mean to me. Uh, so then I was like, Ugh, fine. And I met this really wonderful guy that I dated for quite some time. And I was like, it's not for me, baby. It's just not. <laughs> it's just not. And then I shortly met Lisa. And that was kind of well, You haven't extent. even dated that many people? I haven't dated that many. But listen, I have been perceived as quite the hoe. By whom? America. Why? But I, I don't know. Because I'm gorgeous. I don't know, babe. They Because I'm wild and I'm crazy. But the misconception is... That I'm wild and I am, but not like that. Like I have not had that many partners. And I would say, like, I don't care, I'm not embarrassed. Nothing I was just trying to figure out my sexuality. Now don't try to deter from the game. Okay, yeah, yeah. Let's go. Back on you. Charlie D'Amelio, you criticized, but then asked for her help when your TikTok got taken away. Did she help you? No. She didn't help you. She didn't have to. She shouldn't, you know. But I don't regret that. Okay. (laughs) Okay, De- then we're not. There's no apology there. No. Good. What did you say exactly to her? I saw a video. <laughs> I, 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 it's funny how the tables have turned. I saw she was 15 at the time, and I saw a video come up on my for you page of her where she was dancing, like gyrating, like sexually, doing like a sexual choreography to a song about sucking dick with the lyrics that were very explicit, and I'm like. And I forget, and, and all I said, this is all I said. I asked a question. My question was, is this appropriate? That's all How I said. dare you? That's all. I wasn't slut shaming, body shaming. I just asked a question. Is this appropriate? And it just blew up into yeah. this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think you think that, do you think you see things differently because you have two little girls now? Yeah. I'm like, yeah. I don't. If I'm going to be real extra honest, I don't think that was appropriate. If, but then I should have, I sh- what I, the, the lesson is because she was 15, I should have maybe posed it at her parents. Like, should her parents take yeah, this down? Yeah, not directly at her. Yeah. Is this appropriate? Maybe I should have posed it. Like, is this appropriate to still be up? Her, should her parents take it down? I, I don't know. Like, maybe you should have just called CPS. 
<laughs> but she's done very well for herself. She really has. Okay. Fergie wrote the song Pedestal after allegedly. I already did apologize. Getting in a fight. Okay, so this was about you. Yes. And you apologized. And she invited me to her baby shower. I and love we, that. Did you go? I went. And was it lovely? It was. It was. She Look was at lovely. You. It's nice to, but not a, not everybody is as gracious as that. And Who's they don't not have been to be. so gracious? Anybody? I had, you know, I was on the hills, and I had a moment with Misha Barton, and I was really awful towards her in the past. And obviously, you know, reality TV, you don't see everything. I knew it wasn't scripted, but it was produced. Meaning, I knew what I was signing up for. I knew what they wanted out of me. Yeah, and. I get there and I give them what they want from me, which is an apology. And I apologized. And you didn't see that. What you saw was afterwards where, you know, we had done like, I don't know, it was like 30 minutes of me and Misha just talking. And I'm like, okay, great. I've talked in circles and apologized for 30 minutes. And I was sincere. And then she wasn't having it. And I was like, okay, cool. All right, okay, we're done, right? Like we're done. <laughs> I was like, I thought we were done. So, okay, listen, I just want you to know, like, now that we're done, like, I really am. I didn't mean any of it. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just kidding. I'm no, just no, kidding. I'm just no, kidding. I'm truly sorry. And if I can go back in time and do things differently, I would. And she just wasn't believing me. And then I got heated and it was reality TV and I was in the moment. And it was do like, you feel like... In a sense, do you feel like you're sensitive in the sense that when you say I'm sorry and people don't take you for face value, it no, no, kind of I, I, I got you? stupid because I was like, I swear on my children's life, mm. and she's like, I don't care. I'm like, I just swore on my kid's life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if anybody doubts me, like, here are all the reasons why if I can go back in time and do things differently, I would. Tell me. Number one, I know, I really know the hurt that I've caused now to a lot of people, and I didn't, or I didn't care. I care now because. I've just more like I think also, I mean not that having children changes everything, but having kids changed a lot for me, and for selfish reasons, for selfish reasons, I would go back in time and do things differently. I know I have so many opportunities taken away from me and so many doors closed on me because of who I am, because of my past. I could have still been sassy and fun and loud and gotten a lot of attention without being mean, nasty, cruel, or hurtful. Right. Yeah. And hopefully people can see me as a cautionary tale. You know, the internet, social media is forever. You know, if you say something bad, people can come up with receipts 10 years, 15 years I, later. I do want to ask you though, because knowing how close you are with your mother and you're very good to your mother, uh, and you have been uh, clearly since you've been 14 years old and hearing that story about your grandfather and father, I think is a story that we all do have to remember because I still believe that you were in a lot of pain. Um, did your mother ever say maybe you should stop? My mom never even read my website. Oh, so she was not even she, a fan. She, your mother <laughs> isn't even a fan of yours. Get her in you here. You know, she... Uh, she she, oh, she only started texting a few years ago. Like she's <laughs> not that old, but she's from Cuba and of a different mentality, um, not very tech savvy. So she never had a computer and she wouldn't read it on, my, on the phone. And she just, she wasn't really aware of everything going on and was just supportive and protective and also appreciated that I was able to provide for her. Is that what it was about as well? Being oh, able yeah. to create a brand that paid enough for you to provide for your mother? And my sister. I, I, it became a family operation pretty quickly by 2007. So that's another reason why I was afraid of changing things. Because it wasn't just my livelihood. It was that of my mother's and my sister's too. Did you take a financial hit when you yeah. pulled back and yes. started acting more... Yes, because people are hypocrites. Right. And if I were to do and say and show all of the things that I did back then, it would still work. People would still eat it up. Because other people are doing it now like I used to, and they're doing it pretty well. And like, I don't know, um, who's like your favorite female singer? Oh, here, here we go, here we go. I don't do this anymore, but let's say 
if there was a Dua Lipa sex tape or naked photos of her that leaked, I'm not going to publish those. But if, but I know that people would seek that shit out. I would like to say, um, just totally candid, I do need a reboot a little bit in my career. If I make a sex tape with Lisa, would you like to release it, Loki? <laughs> you don't need to make a sex tape. What are you talking about? I'm just kidding. Listen, if you're going to do that, do OnlyFans. I, I can't. Do you have an OnlyFans? I, listen have to you me. been asked? I would love to do an OnlyFans, but as cool as I think I am, baby, I can, I'm too insecure. I can't put myself out there like that. I'm not, the, I'm not that bitch. I can't do it, but I commend the girls that do. I mean, the ones posing, that are doing it, it's crazy. They're making millions of dollars. They're making of millions dollars. of dollars. Millions, millions. I think I don't also, knock the hustle. I don't knock the hustle but, at all. I might but, start a wiki feat, to be honest. But I don't want any of my kids doing that. I like to be honest. Yeah. I would be disappointed if my kids were doing that on for their career, but... Yeah, I think it's just such a different time. People are making money in such a different way. I will say, though, that I... Uh, I'm so happy that you came on because oh, I do, you. I do one adore you. And I, I think too, that I do think it's important. You've always taken all full accountability whenever I've talked to you or when anybody that I know has, <laughs> and I do think that you've changed. I think you're a really great dad. Uh, I love to watch you with your children. I love to see your hustle here oh, in Vegas I and love following Vegas. you. I do too. And I, I do believe, look, I will speak for myself. I've done a lot of things I wasn't always proud of, but I had a lot of grief and uh, well, yeah. Let's survival. talk about that for a When so you were estranged from your dad when you were younger, and then your mom you had issues with. Who did you have then? I had myself. At a, did you have siblings? I had my brother. How old is your brother? Older, younger? He's three and a half years younger than me. Younger. So, so I went on American Idol. And people are always like, oh, did you want to be famous? And I'm like, no, bitch. I wanted that golden ticket out of that life and to take my brother with me. And that's exactly what I did. I moved to LA at 16 uh, and I took my brother with me. And you moved at 13? Yeah. He would spend the summers with me and then I'd send him back for school. I'd get him for all of his breaks. And it was really intense. Sometimes it sounds so crazy. People like did that really happen and i'm like yeah it really happened did, babe. you mentioned your grandmother did you live with her i never lived with my grandma but we Who lived down the live street with i lived with my mother but Who i had a lot of issues uh-huh yeah there were a lot of and, and when you know, she had and when she was in treatment for her psychiatric problems you were living with her girlfriend as well yeah the girlfriend was living uh in my home um, but I was taking care of everything. I had, a, I mean, I had a, why I love Vegas is I was working at an oxygen bar inside the New York, New York. Uh, I was 15 and a half putting myself through Catholic school. That's how I paid my tuition. Which one? I went to Gorman. Oh my God. Really? Uh -huh. I made the cheer team. My, the thing about me is I was also not popular and I was bullied, but I was so resilient and funny that I was always able to get myself to the top. I left super popular because I just knew how to make people laugh. And um, and that's really how I think I got through all of my 20s and all of my early 30s by just being resilient and funny until I realized where it all came from. And then I was like, oh, okay, it's time so to go to therapy. And then why were you estranged from your dad? Um, life. It was just, I think that like my mom uh, and him divorced and he wanted to move on and have a different life. He had and other kids? He did. He got remarried and had other kids. And you felt like abandoned? Is that it? Yeah, I really did. And I felt like, and we've talked about this in therapy. I, I wasn't happy being left essentially home alone with my younger brother. I felt there was a lot of responsibility that I had to take on. Did he know that was happening, your dad? Um, he did. But I, look, I, I will say I, I think it's very difficult being a parent while also trying to heal wounds from your own parents. And that's what I've learned in therapy. And then you've, you've mended your relationship with your dad, but now you're estranged from your mom. Yeah. Did something happen there or it was just she's mentally not capable? I mean, what, what, why were you able to fix things with your dad and not with your mom? The only difference with my dad is he was willing to go to therapy and he was willing to do the work and he was willing to acknowledge and validate my side of the story. And I'm not a grudge holder. I'm not a, um, 
I don't want to fight with people. I like, I'm a big lover, especially of my parents. I want my parents. So I, um, I didn't want to hold it against him. He did everything he could in this moment. And I think that's the lesson here of the whole show. Like he can't go back. You can't go back. There's no going back. He hurt me a lot. He's willing to acknowledge it today. And if I want him in my life, I don't want to hold it against him. We're moving forward. He's a great dad. He texted me before this. He was so pleased to watch this. He was proud of my things. And that's all I can ask for. And I think that's why cancel culture should be cancel and culture. What was, what was like, was there like a defining, like an incident that happened with your mom that said like, I'm done with you? Or it was just like a gradual, like, oh, I just can't deal with all the drama anymore. It was a really, it was a gradual, we sort of stopped having a relationship once I moved to LA. And so you haven't had a relationship with her in, for 15 years? Yeah, it's been very, very on wow. and off. Because once I moved to LA, I was out. Like, yeah. I was away from it all. And I was like, how do I survive like how do i stay healthy and she's still here in vegas your mom yeah she is so now you're here do you have any desire to try to make things better with her i don't because i don't. I, I feel like i also don't subscribe to look you can't help somebody who doesn't want to get the help and i'm moving into a phase in my life where i'm getting ready to get married and how is she not wanting to get like is she does she have addiction issues um, there's a lot of different issues. There's just, I think it's mental health issues. I believe is she not getting help health. for them? Um, I think that she is, I, I don't Does know. Does she have a job? Is she able I, to support her? You don't even know? What yeah, she, I think that she has a job. I just, um, I think it's difficult to, I'm just not in that place. Do you know what I'm saying? I got and what, therapy. And your, your, your brother, you're still close to him? That's my baby, my brother. My niece actually does a little segment for So Funny It Hurts on social media called uh, Truth Hurts, where uh, people send her questions and she gives her advice inside McDonald's. <laughs> and it's six-year-old advice and it's Aww. the best advice. So it's good. I mean, you you know how it is. You grow up, you get bigger, you realize you became a parent. I became a parent to myself. I'm very much there for my brother and and I'm really happy. And do you see children in your future with Lisa? We're working on IVF. Oh my oh, uh -huh. well, that's hey, that's happening then. Uh -huh, yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh -huh. That yeah. might come before the the wedding. They might, yeah, they might. We're thinking next year. The the beauty of being gay is that we have all the control to sort of bring in the babies. So we're looking at next year. Exciting. I know. And if you could have a dream gig, or what does your dream professional life look like in Las Vegas in in three years or two years? I would like a very successful podcast, of course. Uh, residency, um, and I'd like to have my own sitcom. You know that. I've always wanted my own show. Well, Mark Wahlberg lives here now. And Do you he, know him? No, but I want to. Him. Yeah, Let's he, go get him. he wants to build a studio here, like a Paramount. Oh, wow. Where they can do film, and, like real high quality film and television productions out of. And I think I've always been on the forefront. Like Vegas has always been an entertainment hub. Yeah. But it's going to be even more so. Yeah, it's blowing up now. It's, it's you know, they're going to build a, uh, another arena for a basketball team. And Vegas is where it's at. Yeah. Listen, Everybody Vegas come. Is. Come to Vegas. We love We're it. here. We love it. We're <laughs> here. We're queer. Get used to it. We might start an OnlyFans. We don't know. We don't, you just, will. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> Listen, I love you. I know I that love you, you. Um, have your beautiful babies. Thank you for being my first guest. Oh, my pleasure. Thank, Thank you for you. being in my life since I was 16, whether oh you knew God. it or not, if that's so crazy. And I, I love you. Life happens and then you're old. It yeah. happens so quickly. So just have fun. Yeah. Yeah. Make it fun if it's not fun. Yeah. And you know what? I'll end it with this. I still wake up every morning so grateful for my life. You know, grat gratitude is healing and gratitude gives so much perspective and is the best way, the best lens through look, to look at life through. Yeah. 
It is. So I'm so grateful we had this time Me together. Too, Thank you for joining. And I'm so me. grateful that everybody here is going to uh, hit the subscribe uh, button to and make sure that And if they sure want to listen to you... your podcast, how do they do it? Well, I have a yeah, I have a podcast too. It's the Perez Hilton podcast with Chris Booker. You can listen at perezpodcast.com. I uh, don't have guests. It's just me and my very annoying heterosexual <laughs> co-host. Straight, yeah. Yeah, but it makes for great content because yeah. we diff we are like constantly, like we're like an old married couple. <laughs> uh, but I love him. He's like a brother. I love uh, that. And uh, yeah, no, I'm excited. The future is great. The, few, the present is great and the future is going to be even better. And I can't wait to see you out of here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, we'll hang. Yeah. yeah. Duh. I got to you. meet your, your fiance. I know. I got to meet we'll the have a Kiki. I would love that. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to So Funny It Hurts. <laughs>